So maybe it's your first tournament and you're wondering what's the best game plan to maximize your chances of winning the tournament. Or maybe you've already competed and you didn't quite do as well as you had hoped, so you're looking for a better way to approach planning. So the reality is often trying to have an exact game plan for your tournament is gonna end up being more detrimental than helping you. So first I'm gonna go through the negative components of trying to make an exact game plan for a tournament, and then I'm gonna give you a much better way to approach trying to prepare and maximize your chances at winning the tournament. So first off, when I say making a game plan for a tournament, what I'm referring to is when people try to have an exact set of techniques or strategy that they're gonna implement and they visualize and they try to force during the match. The first main problem with this is that most game plans are not enforceable. You have to understand that techniques only work when they're used at the right moment versus the correct body positioning. For example, if I'm in closed guard and I want to go for an arm bar, it's my favorite submission, but my opponent puts both of his arms behind his back and he leans backward, I can't do an arm bar. I have to go for a collar choke or maybe a hip bump sweep. So if you have a favorite guard position, let's say you like to play De La Hiva guard where you control your opponent's leg with your hand on their ankle, that may be your favorite guard. You study it, you prepare, you go into the tournament and you pull guard and your opponent goes to both knees. Now you can't control the ankle. Or you may go in and you're planning on uh, playing your guard and then your opponent pulls guard and he refuses to go on top. So you can't know beforehand what your opponent's gonna do. So almost always whatever you chose to make your game plan, your opponent can respond in a way that makes that impossible. Another example would be if you like to play guard controlling your opponent's sleeve with your left hand and playing collar sleeve on that side, but your opponent leads with the other leg and the opposite side sleeve is forward, then you're going to be out of play and you can't reach that and you get stuck in this chasing loop. So not only is this less effective, but one of the real damages of this is that it brings you out of a present state. If you're already planning on doing a certain move or a certain guard position before the match starts, and then the guy doesn't give you the response that makes that possible, you get stifled in your head. You're chasing for the position like, where is it? I'm supposed to do it. And it's not there. And you're less likely to observe what's actually there. If you're opponent approaches you and gives you the body position that makes a triangle choke relevant, but you're stuck in your head looking for the arm bar that you pre-planned to do, you are way less likely to identify the move that actually is relevant for that moment. Additionally, this can cause a negative thought cycle. If you go in with a really well thought out plan and you try to execute it and the person gives a different response, when it doesn't work, you start to panic because you go off of your game plan and this can lead into a negative thought cycle making you think you did something something wrong because you weren't able to execute the game plan when in reality there's nothing you can do that would force him to give you the response that would have made it relevant. Another huge negative of this is that it makes preparing for a tournament so much more stressful because you feel like there's something you're supposed to be doing. There's some game plan or something that you have to do and that if you don't do it you fail to prepare and thus you're going to lose. And this makes you constantly leading up to the tournament stressed out because you think that there's this uh, perfect game plan that if you enacted, you would be able to win and now you have to solve what that is. Then as you lead up to the tournament, you keep constantly trying to remind yourself of what the plan is, what you're gonna do, and this builds so much anxiety and stress, which incidentally is more likely to make you perform less good in the tournament than better. Another effect of chasing that move that you planned in the tournament when it's not actually there is that it's much less energy efficient. If your opponent is just giving you an easy arm bar, but you're stuck in your head that you wanna go for the triangle, Triangle, you may be able to force it if you have a lot of muscle, but you end up using tons of energy. Whereas if you adapt to the moment and take what they give you, it's going to be way less energy use. And when you're fighting in a tournament, you can have matches that are eight minutes to 10 minutes long, depending on the belt division you're in. And it's very hard to have good cardio for 10 minutes if you're not being energy efficient. Okay, so if making an exact game plan is bad, what should you do instead? First, you need to understand that how you act under high stress is the real demonstration of what your jiu-jitsu actually is. You don't have time in the middle of a fight to be thinking, oh, I'm supposed to be doing this, he's doing that. You just have to trust your instincts and go with the 
moment. I made this analogy in my last video talking like this. The way I like to think about it is like jumping in slow motion. You can do everything technically correct to jump, but if you do it slowly, you won't go in the air. And jujitsu is the same way. An arm bar may work, but if you do it slowly, your opponent's going to defend. If your body gives you a certain response and you try to second guess it, even if you come up with a better choice of move in that moment, you're going to be so delayed in your action time that it won't work. So you're best off going with your instincts in the moment and trusting that that's the best thing you could have done at that time. Of course, you're going to make really bad choices, but that's the purpose of training. When you're in the training room back at the gym, that's when you're trying to adapt your pattern recognition to make good choices. So you should be using your regular sparring in the gym to be reprogramming your patterns so that you get better at it. And when you're in tournament, you just have to trust that what comes out of you is the best thing it could be. That doesn't mean you're always going to win. Of course, sometimes you're going to make bad choices and lose and you correct those back in the gym. The way I always say it is if your skill level is a six out of 10, you can't think yourself into being a 10 out of 10, but you can certainly think yourself into being a four out of 10. You can always overthink things and make yourself perform worse. But if you don't know the right thing, you can't think yourself into being better than you are. So if you imagine taking a vocabulary test and you don't know a word on the test, there's really nothing you can do about it. I mean, imagine, especially if it's in another language, imagine taking a Japanese language test, the symbols pop up and you have no idea what they mean. There's really nothing you can do. You're just wasting time stressing it. So if you only know 10 words in Japanese, when you go into the test, you just hope that one of those words get asked. When something pops up that you don't know, you can't really do anything about it. So then instead, what's the best way to prepare for the test is to increase your vocabulary. And that's very much what you're doing when you compete. You want to increase the vocabulary or the amount of positions and techniques you know and trust that when they pop up at the relevant time, you will know what to do. It's just like reading a book. You can't force the words you wish that were on the page Page, you take one word at a time and if you understand it then you'll understand the sentence if you don't know then you just have to do the best you can in the moment but pre-planning before reading the book the sentences that you wish they would write uh, won't help you to actually understand the sentences that are being written. So your purpose figuratively with your training is to expand your vocabulary so that on tournament day, you are more likely to have a wide set of choices you can make when certain positions appear. So in jujitsu terms, this means really investing in understanding common positions. The hard thing is in the beginning, there's so many positions to learn, it's hard to know what to focus on. So if you're newer, you wanna focus on positions that you know matter the most. Worm guard, heel hooks, barren bellows, that's all cool stuff, but those are way later on. First off, learning to defend your guard with you having no grips is a skill set that's always going to matter. If you can learn to be on your back, have no grips, and just using just pushing and pulling uh, and not holding any particular guards, and you can learn to defend that way, then when you go into a tournament, you'll always be prepared for your opponent trying to pass you. Likewise, if you focus on when you're in a triangle choke, knowing how to finish it. When you're in bottom of side control, knowing how to escape it. When these positions occur, your brain will go, oh, that's right. I know where I am. I know what to do. As you troubleshoot a lot of positions, of course, it's going to benefit you a lot to know common guard positions. If you're doing gi, double sleeve, collar sleeve, de la hiva. There's only so many grip sets. So as you expand your knowledge base in these different positions, then when you're fighting and one of these positions appear, you'll know what to do. If I'm playing in my guard and my opponent stands close to me and I grab his ankle and I've already studied the position of de la hiva holding the ankle, I'll know what to do. But if someone else approaches me and they have their legs back and they're coming forward with their hands, then I can't grab the ankle, so I grab the sleeve instead. But if I've invested a lot of time in understanding collar sleeve or double sleeve or sleeve control positions, I'll know what to do there. So you take the positions as they appear and you build forward. Now, of course, this doesn't mean you won't have favorite techniques or things that you specialize in. But what you'll find is you'll naturally find those things and gravitate to, towards them or excel at them when they appear. So let's say, for example, that you do really well when you control your opponent's ankle. That's like a guard position you like. Well, if your opponent approaches with the hands forward, you can't grab the ankle, of course. So you control the sleeve and you start attacking with that. 
naturally this will make your opponent defend the attacks that you do with the sleeve often this will be uh, arm bars omoplatas triangle chokes he'll defend by putting a leg forward this will expose an ankle you control the ankle and now you're in one of your preferred positions so you will still have things you like to do often you will still have patterns that you use in competition all the time but you can't always go in forcing them a saying i really like is to the man with a hammer all problems look like a nail. And that's what it's like when you go into a tournament, you try to use the same guard for every situation or the same pass for every situation. And that's not really how it works. So there's a few caveats here. One thing is actually at a higher level, game planning can be a little bit easier for a tournament because as you know tons of positions and as the uh, people you compete against becomes less because you know the other high level fighters, uh, you can know specifically their games. So if I have a very well-rounded game and I have to fight a particular opponent who I know plays a certain position all the time, I don't go in preparing like, okay, this is what I'm gonna do because we're gonna go here, but I certainly know their best positions and I'll spend a lot of time in my training preparing and understanding those positions so that if they do happen in a match, I will be ready for it. But again, that's not the same thing as me going in knowing that this is what's gonna happen because it may be their best position, but they may end up deciding to play a new position in the tournament or we end up in a different sequence in the tournament and you can't always predict that. So I make sure I'm prepared, but I'm not forcing things that aren't there. So in the end, what you wanna do is focus on tournament day, trust that you've done all the prep work that you can, you've prepared yourself in the positions and the sequences that you know matter most, and then try to relax and trust your instincts on tournament day. Of course, you're gonna have bad days. You're gonna have days where the tournament doesn't go your way. And this is where the real progress happens. That's when you assess and look at what went wrong in the tournament, where what positions you weren't prepared in, what techniques you didn't understand well enough, and you use specific training and the training back of the gym to readapt those patterns so that the next time they occur in the next tournament, you're more prepared with what to do. And I promise if you can start committing to the system, you'll find as you lead into tournaments, your anxiety level will go down a lot. You'll have a lot more fun because you know there's really nothing you can do. Everything you've already done is all you needed to do to prepare for the tournament. On tournament day, just relax and trust that your best jujitsu will come out. And oddly enough, by not planning exactly what you're going to do and trusting your base knowledge, you will actually perform at your true level rather than overthinking yourself into performing worse. If you guys like this video, leave a comment and let me know what topic you would like to see in the future. I picked this topic because someone in the last video commented about tournament prepping and I thought it was a great idea. Also, if you guys are interested in understanding a lot of the common guard grips, collar, sleeve, double sleeve, De La Hiba, that you're going to encounter a lot when playing guard, I have three courses up on my site breaking all those positions down by almost every pattern that someone can do. So if you're interested in that, be sure to check out my website. I put the link in the description. It's www.johnthomasbgj.com. And as always, if you like the content, like, share, subscribe. Thanks a lot.